Welcome to Don't Everybody Leave. Say howdy to Mac King. Wow. Howdy. I am Mac King. Welcome to another fine episode of Don't Everybody Leave. I'm very excited. Uh, we have uh, another of my favorite magicians and favorite people uh, as a guest today. Uh, stick around uh, for Guy Hollywood. But before uh, Guy comes out, we got uh, the usual cast of characters. And once again, um, stupid Nick Rathot is not here. We have a uh, guy named England. <laughs> we have Vinny, Jacob, and uh, Godot. Uh, hey, fellas. Howdy. 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 Uh, uh, I, I know what happened to Nick if, you, if you're interested, but it's entirely up to you. Oh, what happened to Nick? Well... He was struggling with, you know, he has these abilities that the rest of us don't have, and how should he use them? Should he protect the Earth or not? And, the, you know, Lex Luthor created uh, this uh, <laughs> character named Doomsday. Can we, can we just kind of go forward? He's going to edit this out anyway, right? <laughs> yeah. I because left- because here's, the, here's the problem with what Jacob is saying. Max said, welcome to another fine episode, and this is <laughs> fucking it up already. <laughs> we got to stop this. I have left every eulogy in I the joke. Should not have, I should not have said, yeah, Jacob, what happened to Nick? That was exactly. Funny. I blame myself. I blame myself. <laughs> Mac, I, know. I, know. I, I saw edits. you. Kudo, I saw you yesterday, and you didn't have a beard. <laughs> yeah, my, my beard grows quickly. It's <laughs> oh, my superpower. Shit. I can shave every night in the morning. It's full Santa. Wow. It's, uh, yeah, I, a guy fell off my roof a few months ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Santa Claus. I'm now the Santa. So oh, I see. <laughs> nothing I can do to get rid of it. <laughs> Jacob, can you explain how that all works with Godot having that superpower? No, shut up. No. <laughs> <laughs> he promised uh, a fine so- episode. Let's help him. <laughs> all right. Hey, uh, I got an episode uh, starter. Usually, as we uh, do most weeks, we start with somebody you know who's died since we. Got together last, and um, let's see. Uh, we could, you want to bring up a picture, maybe? I don't know, Nikki. So that is uh, Barbara Rickles. <gasps> Don Rickles. Don Rickles' wife died. Yeah, oh, I didn't know that. They were married for like. You probably Never. know, Mac. Since you're about to talk yeah, about well, it. I don't know. I mean, it's a lot of years. I mean, and they, you know, I mean, he made fun of their marriage. You know, talking about his wife. Uh, you know, made jokes about his wife for years and years and years but you know they apparently for all according to everybody that you talk to had the happiest marriage in all of you know yeah, they were apparently really. the two greatest lovebirds of all time. i think they were married for 60 plus years something like that you know and crazy. uh you know so i mean it's just something to shoot for uh, not not dying this past week <laughs> but uh, being married and happy uh, for that long uh, uh gudo and i were at Don Rickles' last ever Vegas show. Yeah, I would say before he died, but I feel like that's implied. <laughs> um, but he, so he at that show it, it could not, could no longer really stand very well. He had had, uh, forgive the term, flesh eating disease in his knee. Um, so he did the whole show seated, but they lit the first two rows, and he eviscerated everybody in the first two rows that he could see. And then he did stand up twice in the show. With, with help from his musical director. His musical director got under his arms and lifted him up. And the two times he stood were one, because he needed to goose step for a Nazi joke. <laughs> 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 and the other one was because he had a joke about banging his wife and he wanted to illustrate that. And so he had his, he had his, his musical director holding him up while he's doing these old man. Yeah, it was, it was pretty great. It was really sweet, lovely. <laughs> Show well, when I, the, the, I saw him, uh, did you, was that at the Stardust? Is that where you saw him? Orleans. No, Orleans. Yeah, Orleans. Oh, at the Orleans. I ago. saw him at the Stardust, uh, pr- probably a few years be- prior to that because he could still, he you know, move about under his own power. But it, I mean, it was great seeing seeing that, and it, it was yeah, just a yeah. delightful. We were scene. lucky to be there, yeah. Virtuoso of anger. <laughs> <laughs> you talk about the, you know, he got out of the cancel culture because I think everyone understood where his heart was. 
And that's the most important thing in that. And if you see a clip of someone on YouTube, you might not know where their heart is, but with him, you always did. So you, uh, uh, speaking of happily married, uh oh, <laughs> you, I, I, you know, our, our, my, the audience for this show and the audience for Penn Sunday School are probably, uh, there's probably a tiny bit of crossover. But I bet a lot of people watching this don't know about you and your marriage. <laughs> is, is. <laughs> My many marriages conveniently well, you're many. to the same girl, which is M really Yeah, M-I-N-I. Your yeah. M-I-N-I, Mimi, yeah. marriages. Kudo's, uh, <laughs> Kudo's ex-wife is also his current wife. It's pretty yeah. cool to it makes set it that easy. up that way. <laughs> Also, the yeah. thing that I did that was really smart was to get married on the same day, so I didn't have two anniversaries. <laughs> <laughs> good thinking, huh? Pretty yeah, good. yeah, good thinking. Yeah. Now just one gift. I don't have to do two gifts. <laughs> then uh, I was not at the first of those. Uh, nuptials. I'm sorry. Yeah, that was before I met you, which is that's but the, uh, but the second one I was at, and it was one of my favorite weddings. And well, thank you. One of, yeah, and one and it wasn't because of you or your lovely wife, Teresa. <laughs> But it was because of Peter. Petofsky. The great yeah. Peter Petofsky falling down the stairs at my wedding. Yeah, it's unbelievable. You, you guys should it explain was. who Peter is. I'll insert some, some clips of him. Here in this <laughs> Peter is uh, perhaps the greatest living clown. <laughs> in uh, in uh, 1980, I joined Ringling Brothers Circus and worked with a fellow named Peter Petofsky who was insane. A clown 100% of the time. Uh, Another 45 minutes alone. <laughs> How many people convinced this is not an act I'm doing? <laughs> See, whether you're here or not, I'm doing a show, baby. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> funny everywhere. All, it's all He will walk up to strangers and lick their heads. We talked about with uh, misbehave licking heads. He was the person who had the contract in Vegas that he was not allowed to lick anyone's head during a show. They had been... <laughs> They had had so many complaints of him licking heads that they put it in his contract <laughs> that he could no longer lick heads. <laughs> and he has worked uh, just everywhere doing some great funny clowning. The problem is that he is full-time clown. And so he has trouble managing money and things like that, as one would expect from a full-time clown. But I mean, I've been at yeah. Sardi's with Jim Dale. when Jim Dale was starring in Barnum on Broadway and Peter flipped and fell down the stairs at Sardi's intentionally. I just want to, how you been? <laughs> I like to walk into a chiropractor's office and say, Doc, I got this, uh, I don't know. Every time I do this, is this a problem? <laughs> And the waiters went insane trying to help him. <laughs> and Jim Dale was crying in tears. It was uh, great, really. And constant. A hundred percent. I live next, so I live next did... door to Peter on a train. And in the morning, Peter, you'd hear out of Peter's room, you going, uh, I, I, I. <laughs> he just sitting in his room. <laughs> he woke up every morning. His alarm clock was, uh, was Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> oh, dear. Well, so, my recollection, you probably have a better memory, but at your wedding, I mean, it seemed like there was like some balcony or something. Big there were balcony like entrance curved, with fancy curved stairs. Staircases. Yeah, yeah cur curved staircases, and he tumbled all the all way down. All the way down. <laughs> Use the handrail. We oh, 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 
around this curved staircase. Yep. Did, did he tumble up the other side? Because that would. No, man, no. <laughs> so what was what was your wife's reaction to that? Did she think it was fantastic? Because I did think it was fantastic. By then, she had gotten used to the idea that that's what was going to happen. We'd already had a wedding, and it happened in the first <laughs> one as well. She knew. <laughs> People were shooting rubber bands at the first wedding, so uh, she so, she knew things were going to go uh, as they did. <laughs> so we're going to bring out. Don't bring him up yet, Nikki. But we're going to bring out Guy, and I I'm going to put Jacob on the spot because I uh, know. Well, okay. you know it's coming. Uh, no, you know. Uh, every time we've had anybody who has appeared on the world's greatest magic. It has become apparent that Jacob knows every second of every word that person said on those shows. He studied those shows backwards and forwards. And uh, I'm sure that you know every word of Guy's introduction. I can't remember whether they had a voiceover introduction for Guy Hollingworth on The World's Greatest Magic or No, what. it was... But I, it, it, it was, okay, yeah. tell me what it was. I knew you would. <laughs> It was it was John Ritter. Uh, they also had voiceover during uh, Guy's act that I that I also remember, um, and I remember what the title card was. Uh, anyway, uh, you want you want Ritter's intro? This is going to ruin. I my, do. My, I want, I want you to introduce Guy Hollingworth as John Ritter. Okay, word for word, I assume. Uh, every now and then here at World's Greatest Magic, we're fortunate enough to discover a new magician who's just breaking into the business. Such is the case with 22-year-old Guy Hollingworth. His voice will tell you where his fr he's from, but his magic will tell you where he's going. From the newest attraction here at Caesars, the Magical Empire, please welcome the incomparable close-up magic of Guy Hollingworth. <laughs> 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 it seems like only yesterday. It's yeah. <laughs> right. I cannot tell you how embarrassed I am. <laughs> I was going to tell you Mr. how Dr. happy Jacob. I am. <laughs> sure you have it memorized too. Was that correct? Uh, not only do I not have it memorized, uh, the weird thing is I didn't actually see it at the time, or for a really long time afterwards. Uh, it was a it was a really strange situation because I was at university. I was studying uh, in in the UK. And, you know, World's Greatest Magic wasn't a thing. I mean, it wasn't broadcast on the UK networks. And I recorded that, I guess, over the, the summer or the spring or something. And it went out in November. And um, I honestly only remembered in the evening. It was like I looked at my uh, my diary and it was the 22nd of November. And it was like, oh, that, that show I think is going out tonight. And I then didn't see it for weeks afterwards and didn't even know it had happened. So, yeah, I have no recollection at all. <laughs> that is the coolest move ever to be on that show and just be like, oh, yeah, didn't even know. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no way about it. It wasn't, it wasn't it anything didn't... cool. It was, an, it was simply because we were isolated on the other side of the planet. Yeah, Jacob right, is on this no, show, yeah. and you should see what he talks about every time he's on the show. <laughs> yeah, I've only memorized. Yeah, no. That's, but you, uh, I hope you know that there were people who were getting into magic around the time that that aired who uh, watched you put that card back together and our faces melted off. And uh, so that's, you're, you're directly responsible for my career. Uh, whether or not that's too much pressure for you. <laughs> no, or blame. Too much blame. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's really nice to, to know. As I say, I mean, genuinely, I had no idea at all that if anyone had watched it, let alone if anybody liked it, um, it was only, you know, in the years that followed when I would go to a magic convention or someone and, and someone would come up to me and say, I'd, I'd seen that program. Genuinely, I had no idea uh, whether it had any real reach or impact. So it's nice to know that it did on at least... Um, one person we met at that taping is the oh, right. first yeah. time we met. Yeah. So yeah, Mac, right. you were in the room when that right when he's when he's doing that close up set. Yeah. I might have been in the room when he did that close up set. Uh, yes, I remember. Hey Nikki, can you standing there? Oh, can you pull up the Nikki photo what? of that? The the world's greatest magic photo. There it is. Ah yes. Now you know, the weird thing I remember. Oh, they even spelled my name wrong. That's great. Oh, they put the S in there. Uh, in there. <laughs> I never noticed that till just now. I'm so no, sorry. Yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> that's ruined the whole thing. Okay, the whole thing should be consigned to history. Uh, the weird thing was, I mean, I'd never done uh, TV or anything before. And uh, uh, so people sort of asked me, was I nervous? And I suppose I would have been. But those people who were sort of watch the people who were around me, 
they were all so nervous. There were all these people who were kind of hoping this was going to be their big break and someone was going to spot them and they were going to be the new star of some TV program. <laughs> and I was sort of there as kind of the, the pro, the, the, the showbiz pro. And I was just sort of told, can you kind of put these people at ease? So I was trying to sort of talk to them and show them, you know, I was doing Ambitious Garden, whatever. And so by the time I actually came to do it, I'd, I'd kind of forgotten that I was nervous. So that kind of worked quite well, actually. Cool. That's a, yeah. Amazing, considering well, how difficult the material you chose to do was. The most awkward thing about that whole experience, actually, was my wife, um, because I was at, I was at university at the time, and this was way before mobile phones, and so the only way you could get hold of me was by phoning a payphone at the end of the corridor, and someone might answer it, and so there was no way we could actually communicate in order to get the, the show arranged. So people would phone the, my home, my parents' house. And so my mum would usually take a message for me. And every now and then I would speak to somebody, one of the producers on the show or one of the people who was arranging it. And quite early on, at the beginning of one of the calls, just as we were signing off, uh, they said, I'll give you a ring next week. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I might not be around next week. And they said, oh, it's fine. We can just leave a message with your wife like we did last time. And it was right at the end of a call. So you kind of, you don't, it doesn't really matter who the person who's taking a message is. You're not going to make it. So, you know, it's just fine. We, we hung up. And so, of course, this then went on week after week that then, you know, again, my, mother, my wife, wife, my mother. <laughs> <laughs> and the consequence was that because I hadn't corrected it, it got more and more difficult to correct it each time. And so by the time I actually got to Las Vegas, one of the first questions I was asked was, you know, so how long have you ma been married? And I was asked all these questions about my wife. Who by, by then, the whole team sort of had this picture of my wife and it, then I couldn't just say I'm not married that was my mum you've been speaking to it was just too <laughs> serious fictional wife who existed throughout the world's greatest magic oh that's fantastic <laughs> the other piece from it that I remember and they did this with a bunch of the acts is they got Don LaFontaine who's the famous movie preview you know when you watch a movie preview and the guy goes in a world that guy Schwarzenegger. Terminator 2, Judgment Day. This time he's back. Yeah. And they got him to just say stuff in the middle of people's acts that you don't ever need to say. You know, the kind of magic patter that we try to steer away from, they had a voiceover guy say. And you <laughs> did, uh, I'm going to show my ignorance. I think it's called yeah, Waving the Aces. Yeah. 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 And there's just one more. Now, this is your last chance to catch me out, so watch it really carefully. Okay, I'll do it as slowly as I can with just a snap of the fingers. Just like this. There it is. Our last card. Thank you. Yeah, and he and he they they showed a piece of it in slow motion and had him go, even in slow motion, it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and the thing that I, I do remember seeing that bit actually, and the bit that I remember in slow motion, I didn't even notice the cards. I remembered going. <laughs> 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 For some reason, they just caught me. I must have been saying something wrong. All I saw is slow motion of my tongue. I guess you didn't need to see that. The Michael Jordan of cards. <laughs> yeah. You sell it now as an <laughs> NFT. Oh, I can't wait to rewatch that. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> no, I mean, I had it on VHS, and I would, uh, you remember, you could do this with a VHS. Pause. And then you could step forward one frame at a time. Right. That was as a, as a non-magician just about to get into magic. Turns out that doesn't help you figure out how that card goes back together. <laughs> it didn't help at all. <laughs> well, that's, that's basically how I started, you know. Uh, the, there was a TV series called um, The Best of Magic. Best of Magic. Um, John Fisher, uh, BBC series. And uh, they had great, great magicians on, on that. And uh, Channing Pollock was, was it. Um, there was a clip of him from The Ed Sullivan Show. And that was basically what I did, was I would just frame by frame try and work out how those right. cards were getting moved around. And, uh, yeah, that's how I started. Yeah, Channing's Dove Productions, it turns out, <laughs> watching them slower doesn't help either. No, <laughs> that's true. They still, they still completely fool you. Yeah. So Lance, did you Channing, do like that? that was my introduction to Lance was on The Tonight Show, watching him frame by frame. But 
Gudo, you knew but Channing. At least Channing didn't stick his tongue out. <laughs> <laughs> Gudo, you yeah. got to hang out with Channing a few times, right? Yeah, quite a bit, actually. I'm told he was as well. classy as classy as he seemed. He was. He was delightful. Always, always a pleasant, kind gentleman. And uh, he was funny. He was even nice to me. You know. Wow. And, <laughs> yeah, I met, him, I met him a few times as well, and uh, you know that was a hero for me, yeah, certainly. Yeah. So I was. Yeah, but he must have. He must have. He must have really. Uh, respected what you did and i don't know that he did <laughs> respect for what, what i do <laughs> what i do <laughs> yeah nice to have that mutual admiration society wasn't it mr hollingworth <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, i was chanting it was chanting an influence at all with you going the the tails with the white tie uh look was that partial yeah, from absolutely. Yeah, I always wanted magic. I always wanted to do. I think basically seeing Channing made me want to do magic. Guy, yeah. the first time the first time I saw you perform live, I I was absolutely blown away, and it is in easily within the top five magic experiences of my life. When you did expert at the card, well, you've table. been to my show six times, <laughs> and it's in there. <laughs> Mac, you're in there. You're, but okay. but uh, at, at uh, Magic Live uh, a while back, you did ex you you put on expert at the card table, and I, I had no expectation or no knowledge of before going in and seeing it, and then just being like, just blown away by the theatrics of it, the story of it, like all those elements together. On top of the magic was amazing, but I just it as a show was just one of my highlights was that a, a an idea that you had when you were really young and it just kept growing and growing or how what was the genesis of it well thank you very much for saying that i appreciate it um it's it's very kind it's um the answer is it was a complete mistake um <laughs> i i was um i don't know how old i was i was probably around about 20 or something like that and um uh my friend Arpel wilson uh, he was still living in Scotland uh, at the time, and he used to do a show at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival pretty well every year. And he had got uh, a slot booked, and he was going to, it was a tiny little space, it seated about 20 people, and he was all booked in to, to do a show. But at the last minute, he couldn't do it. His normal job at the time prevented him from doing it, so he, he needed to find someone to fill in. So he called me because he knew I was, I can't remember, I was at school, university at the time, but I'd be around over the summer. And he said, would I like to take a show um, and do it at, at Edinburgh? And I thought, well, that sounds fun. He said, the only thing is that the whole Edinburgh Fringe Guide has already been printed. And so the name of the show is in all the guides. And I decided to call the show The Expert at the Card Table. So you're going to have to do a show called The Expert at the Card Table. Hi, guys. Jason England here. We just wanted to take a quick second for those of you that are not magicians to tell you a little bit about this subject we're discussing, Erdnace, that was a person's name, and the book that he produced in 1902 called The Expert at the Card Table. A lot of subjects have seminal texts that are foundational to that subject. For instance, Gray's Anatomy is sort of a foundational anatomy text. Euclid's The Elements is the foundational geometry text. Sir Isaac Newton's Principia would be the foundational text for uh, physics, for instance, classical physics anyway. And The Expert at the Card Table is a foundational text for both card magic as well as gambling and cheating techniques. So the first half of this book is all about how to cheat at cards. And the second half of this book uh, is magic tricks using some of those techniques from the first half. And no one really knows who wrote the book. Uh, there is an author listed S.W. Erdnase, E-R-D-N-A-S-E. -E. If you spell that backwards, you get E.S. Andrews, which is a much more likely name, but no one knows who E.S. Andrews was uh, either. We've been trying to figure it out for about 120 years now, and some progress has been made, but the truth is we still don't know who wrote the book. 
And uh, I've been a collector of this book for many years now. And I've managed to collect about 80 different printings, uh, some of them in foreign languages. I've got a first edition like this one. This was the way it was originally produced in 1902. A couple of uh, hardback uh, early editions from the early 1900s. And then every other edition that's been published ever since then. Uh, and I believe there's about 80 of them up here. So it's a really interesting area of study for people like me that are interested in both gambling and magic. And uh, now you know a little bit about what we're talking about here when we uh, talk to Mr. Hollingworth about his interaction with this book over the years and the, uh, uh, the play that he created around this book. Now you know. <laughs> now, uh, Paul had not um, specifically tied it to the book, as far uh, as far as I know. I don't think that was his plan. It was just that was a good name for a show. But I, at the time, I'd read in Genie magazine a review of the book called The Man Who Was Erdnays, which had this theory about Milton Franklin Andrews having been Erdnays. And I sort of thought, well, that's a really interesting premise. So basically, I, I knew I was going to do the card tricks I did anyway. So I went up to Edinburgh. And I got hold of a copy of that book and um, <clears throat> spoke to a couple of friends. And on the first opening night of the show, I literally said, you know, expert at the card table, name of this really cool book. Here's a card trick. And it was written by someone, no one quite knows who it is. Here's another card trick. And uh, some people think he was this guy who was actually a murderer. Now there's another card trick. And it literally started <laughs> off like that. Uh, and I found that people were actually kind of interested in that story. So literally as the show was happening at Edinburgh, I was kind of, rewriting it and putting in bits about the story. And by the end of the show, uh, of the run of the shows, I thought actually there seems to be something here. So ever since then, I've kind of just been almost constantly rewriting it to try and make it more about the story and more theatrical and, you know, it's got the card tricks in it. So by the time I did it at Magic Live, that was after I'd uh, done it for a second time at the uh, Edinburgh Festival about 12 years later. And by that time, uh, I had a producer and a director, Neil Patrick Harris had directed it. So, you know, it was a, a hundred times better than my own efforts on my own. Um, but it's sort of, it's continued to evolve. And um, theoretically, I'm supposed to be doing it again this this summer um, at Liberty Magic, uh, if that's permitted uh, with, you know, everything that's going on in the world. And so it'll yeah, be- a Liberty sort of, Magic here in the US. Exactly. It depends whether or not you are, your doors are open to mm -hmm. us Brits. To get off the subject a little bit, Guy. Wait, are you talking to me the, or? or you're, <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. From England. Um, <laughs> I sorry, sorry to be so vague. <laughs> and uh, feel free, Mr. From England, to just say, uh, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> and because we, we do it's lightly fun. edit. We, we do lightly edit these, so you right. can just we'll take out your uh, saying "fuck off." No, I don't want to do that. <laughs> but um, I would love to, I would love for you to tell my friends um, the joke about the nun. <laughs> would, uh, it, well, you, but you don't have to. I know that's uh, sort of uh, off brand for Guy Hollingworth. It is slightly. No, I'm going to tell you to fuck off on that one. Okay. <laughs> right, good. That was that was better than the joke. Uh, I don't know whether you're even prepared, but if you were uh, able to do a card trick for uh, my friends and our seven viewers, we'd love it. Uh, look at Jacob. Jacob's like can't even stand up right now. He's so excited. <laughs> would you? Would you? In fact, do a? I would. In fact. I actually, <laughs> in reality, I will do that. And I'll do it for if any. If it's any card at any number, we're not going for it. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a couple of mishaps with any card at any number. Uh, right. <laughs> okay. I will First mishap that. was it didn't work. The second mishap was it did work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I will, uh, I will do something that you probably will. Well, I know. Jacob will have seen before, but I'll do it anyway. So that's just the way. I love that. Nikki, can you make okay. Guy um, the larger on the screen? While that's happening, um, it's always a little awkward to do pick a card things. So it, it honestly doesn't make any difference. But <clears throat> as I go through, Jacob, just tell me when to stop. Stop. Uh, that seems about here, but I could, do you want me to go a little further? Uh, we'll go back. How about the one, the one after that? This one here? 
Yeah. Is that the one? Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, fine. It, it honestly doesn't matter. It's of no consequence at all. Uh, because I'm going to ask, normally I would ask you to sign your name on the card, uh, but obviously that's not possible. Uh, and rather than just writing your name, because I know what your name is, uh, do you want to just give me a word? It can be, it doesn't matter, any word, something that just springs to mind, something on your desk, what you had for breakfast, whatever. How about England? England. A very good word. Okay. I'll write England on the card. Um, actually, I'll write, it, I'll write it on the top just so that you can uh, read it because I would hate you to think uh, that I was cheating. And of course, if I had uh, stooged this ahead of time, I could have got, uh, could have got Jason to actually sign the card, uh, but that's okay. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to fold it in half just like this, and hopefully uh, you get the idea that if I fold it in half and then if I fold it in half again like this, uh, this would actually make uh, quarters. And the reason for this is it gives me uh, these creases down the card that would allow me to tear it up if I wanted to. And as it happens, I do. I'm going to tear it uh, just like this down middle. And I hope you can see, by the way, that this is a genuine tear. Uh, sometimes people think I haven't really torn the card and it's just an illusion. And of course, if you don't believe I've torn the card, then the rest of the trick becomes a little bit pointless. Uh, but I have torn the, uh, the England card, the British card, as it were. And I'm going to tear it into two pieces just like this. And if I put those two pieces together uh, and I then tear them down the middle, then that would give me not two pieces, but of course, uh, four pieces or four uh, four quarters of the card. And the idea is to take them piece by piece, bit by bit, and to try to fuse almost, if you will, to weld them back together to how they were before I tore them up. Uh, thus raising the question, why in fact did I tear them up uh, if I'm just gonna put them back together again? But bear in mind that this trick is not nearly as impressive when I do put the pieces back together if I have not previously torn it up. I thought I should mention <laughs> Uh, we'll start with, with these two over here. Uh, watch closely, because they should fit just like this. Watch carefully. Just over here. Okay. Give a little squeeze. Just like this. Oh, come on. Oh, my God. <laughs> I will try that again because of the overwhelming reaction I got for doing it. Uh, the first time. <laughs> <laughs> What's the next bit? Uh, it fits on here, just like this. You give it a squeeze if I just put it in place. Yeah. Okay, and you can see, by the way, there is no glue, but there's no tape holding it together. It's uh, just in one piece. Uh, but that's three quarters of the card, which leaves just one piece. Now, this is the most difficult because there are two edges, which makes it twice as difficult. But I hope you can see it really does fit in the corner there. And I hope you can all see the word England written at the bottom there. And if you watch closely, that's the first edge. That's the second edge, meaning the entire card is completely restored. And there you have it. Uh, it's only that, but you can't, so you have to take my word for it. There it is, back together. Let's talk about it. There you go. I Cannot thank you enough. That was this is the best day of my entire life. <laughs>Goodness, I defy. I mean, the, the, we have we have non magicians that watch this show, and that 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 is an example of what I was talking about. I mean, they they can replay this and watch that in as slow as they want, and that there's no way to see what that that's yeah, unbelievable. I'm gonna stop fawning now, Mac. Your turn. <laughs> well, I was just gonna get, say, we, uh, uh, it, for the non magicians who would like to learn that, uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably copies are still available. <laughs> that is and, true. Uh, I, I, oh, look at that. Oh, look, there's a, oh, look at that. A collection of drawing room deceptions. And nope. so, Guy, I can't, I, I brought, I pulled this out of my shelf, and I'm looking at your inscription to me, and I believe this is a dig at me for not I having bought worked. this until 2009. <laughs> <laughs> what year did it come out? I think, uh, I think 99 or, or maybe 2000. <laughs> okay, yeah. So this I it was two ten years after 
the publication of Drawing Room Deceptions or the Etiquette of Deception by G.W.R. Hollingworth. <laughs> and uh, the inscription says, to Mac, enjoy the fifth edition. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> With all good wishes and great admiration, Guy. Something. Well, uh, Hollingsworth. Is there an <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you have, you have to, uh, to put an F in as I get the back. Yeah. <laughs> it's a bit of a cheat because a lot of people buy that thinking they'll be able to do that trick you just did. And we all bought it and went, oh, no. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> not, not that it's not in there, it's in there, but you go, oh, that's how it's done. Never in a million years. Okay. <laughs> but there's a. Uh... That's not a great advertisement for the book, Jacob. I don't know why you would say that. Uh, There's a ton of great <laughs> stuff in there. There is a, a ton of other. I mean, it's all great stuff. Uh, I'm curious of two things that I don't ever, I don't think we ever, I ever spoke to you about. Uh, I don't know who, um, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Chomondoli is? Ah, Chumley. Oh, so oh. Chumley. <laughs> yeah. That is pronounced Chumley. You don't spell that C H O L M O N D E L E Y. We do in England. So that's you, like shame. Read it better. <laughs> yeah. Well, the people have brought you Worcestershire. Exactly. It's a Worcestershire uh, situation. Um, so uh, Chumley was the name of my dog, uh, who I was uh, devoted to. And there is actually there are a couple of pictures of Chumley in the illustrations. The, the in when I'm actually doing a sh show in a drawing room, there's an uh, illustration of me with two people either side who are actually my cousins. And in the background, there is a painting on the wall and the dog in the painting is Chumley. Um, and so, yeah, so Chumley, he was a chow chow and we got him when I was, I don't know, I suppose I was eight or nine and I was reading uh, a book um, by Gerald Durrell, who was um, a, a zoologist, a British zoologist. He was from Jersey actually. And uh, these books were written in, I suppose, the 50s, probably, when it was kind of zoologists would literally travel the world and collect animals and bring them kill, back. Yeah, <laughs> kill them. <laughs> that was the way. Yeah, they weren't killed, but they were captured. And, you know, they were, at the time, <laughs> And was then killed. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it, it was kind of considered conservation at the time. You know, that's kind of how, how, <laughs> how animals were kind of introduced yep. to people. Anyway, so um, he had this, this chimpanzee. Uh, and he, the chimpanzee was called Chumley Sinjin. And of course, re reading the book, I read that word Chol Mondali, and, and Sinjin <laughs> is, is spelt St. John. Uh, as it, you know, that, that's, and I remember asking my, my mother about this, and she explained to me that that... You mean your wife? Words. You mean your wife? My wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the same one. The one and the same mother slash wife explained to me that uh, that's an old, very old posh British name, and it's pronounced Chumley Sinjin. And I thought that was so cool. And the reason that the monkey was called Chumley Sinjin is because he was very sort of aloof and very sort of standoffish. And so giving him a posh name seemed appropriate. And so when we got this dog, we got a chow chow, and they're sort of known as being a little bit aloof. Uh, so I thought that was a perfect name. So he was called Chumley. He was, he was actually called Chumley Sinjin. But yeah, nice. that answers your question. And there's a follow-up to this coming out at some point, right? You're in the midst of... <laughs> yeah. I am indeed. I'm writing... 25 years, he's working on the sequel. <laughs> exactly. It's, uh, it's, I've nearly finished writing it. Um, I haven't started illustrating it. And <laughs> so that means it might be another 10 years or so. Uh, and actually, I have some thoughts as to how to do the illustrations in a more time-efficient manner, because uh, they, they did really take an awful long time. And I did... title um the very original more drawing room deceptions <laughs> okay good i'm relieved to hear that because i i think i said in an email i i, uh, I made a joke about calling it bathroom deceptions and <laughs> i was afraid because i i uh i don't you know we're separated by ocean so you probably didn't see my appearance on fool us where i did a trick with a toilet and <laughs> Um, I assumed that you might be jumping on that bathroom magic. 
Yes. Bandwagon. Well, that, 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 I that wanted to be. I city. wanted it clear that that's my territory. In all the world, there is only <laughs> one Mr. Restroom. <laughs> well, it's it's good to have that cleared up. I, I was thinking about various rooms that I could have used as a title, and I have to say, bathroom is <laughs> some way down the list, but I'll, I'll make sure it's permanently removed from the list. Mac Here, also please. has outhouse deceptions as well. So don't <laughs> <there either. laughs> He's going to do the English version. It's going to be the Lou deceptions. <laughs> uh, I want to. I want to hear a uh, a story that I've heard before, but I'm sure a lot of our viewers haven't. Um, and I want to hear about the first time guy worked the castle. <laughs> Um, because it's kind of a funny story. I don't know, Mac, you've probably heard it before, um, but uh, but it's great. So take it away, guy. <laughs> or just well, say fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I well, I will. Yes, I'll tell you. I'll tell you uh, my, my recollection of what what happened. Uh, so I was. Um, I was asked originally what uh, you know what sort of magic I did and where I'd like to, to work and really what I what I love to do is what I would call parlor magic. So I you know I like doing stand up things and most of the magic I do happens up here. So I uh, I asked to to be put in the parlor, and I was uh, I was staying with Mike and Tina uh, Caveney and uh, I was driving into the the magic uh, castle and I was doing my act and it seemed to be going reasonably well. And about two days in, uh, I came back and Tina said to me, uh, we, we've had a message uh, from um, the, the, the organizers at the Magic Castle and um, they're not happy uh, because basically you're, you're doing card tricks in the parlor. And, uh, you know, they were asking if you had any other material. And I sort of told them, well, that was your act. But, you know, is, is there anything else you could do? They were asking, you know, could you maybe do the same tricks with jumbo cards? <laughs> Which, I thought that didn't reflect a particularly deep understanding of the methods. Involved. Um, I, I had to explain that that wasn't wasn't possible, and that was really sort of my my act. Um, so I was I was fired. Uh, I was uh, I was actually fired from the Magic Castle for doing close up magic, as it was deemed to be in in the parlor. Uh, but fortunately, it was actually the same week that Tony Giorgio was performing in the close-up um, room. And uh, if memory serves, he actually uh, was, in fact, also fired as a result of <laughs> telling the audience um, to go fuck themselves, I think. <laughs> basically, yeah. Was that what? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, basically. I believe that's, um, yeah. <laughs> So that was that was a kind of it was it was quite an exciting week in terms of magic <laughs> um, politics, I suppose. So the consequence of that was that he was no longer able to finish his week. So I was then able to slot in and do the uh, the <laughs> second half of the week in the close up room. And the thing that I thought was slightly ironic was that Billy McComb then stood in in the at the last minute in the in the parlor. And you know I was a huge fan of Billy. Um, but he he went in there and he was he was doing card tricks and sponge balls. So it sort of seemed <laughs> yeah, ironic that it kind of worth a full circle. But in the end, it kind of it was actually quite fun because it meant I did actually end up working um, both rooms in, in one week. And actually, I was told afterwards by um, certain powers that be in the the Magic Castle that it had been arranged deliberately so as to give me that opportunity to work in in both rooms. Um, which uh, I'm not sure was entirely uh, how it was at the time, but as I say, it worked yeah, well, yeah. very, very well because I did get to do both rooms. And look, I, you know, I love the Magic Castle. I love performing there, so um, it was fun. So why did uh, why did the other guy tell his audience to fuck off? You never met Tony uh, Giorgio. <laughs> 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 well, the, the extraordinary thing is, I was actually I was in I was actually watching the show, so I I was in the audience. And uh, Tony had I don't a very. Think I knew that. Yeah, <laughs> he had a very he had a very gravelly voice. Um, Tony. I mean, he was a great character. I was I was a big fan of his, and um, but he was quite sort of brusque in his performing style. And uh, a couple of people had ordered drinks, so they were sitting at the the close up table, and Tony had started his set, and the the door opened, and a waiter came in with the drinks for the two people who were sitting at the table, and Tony. Uh, 
sort of told them to go because he'd started his show. So these two people who were waiting for their drinks were really pissed off by the fact that they they kind of they weren't allowed to have a drink while they were watching the show. So um, the next time that Tony then reached for his glass of water, one of the people who was sitting at, at the table who had been denied a drink moved his drink away so he couldn't get his glass of water. And he didn't <laughs> find this funny at all. So it became a bit of banter. And the person who moved the drinks sort of was, was really playing up to it. And in the end said, well, hey, if you're not going to let us have a drink, I'm not going to let you have one either. And he didn't see the funny side and said, well, in that case, you can all just fuck off. And uh, so that was that was kind of the awkward oh. point of the show. And I <laughs> left at that point. You shouldn't wow. do that. I wonder if you would indulge us and explain some to dumb Americans uh, some of the way the legal stuff works in England, because I find it fascinating. What does that mean? That, that could take a long yeah, time. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah, Jacob, geez. Why don't you say, what do you actually do for a job? Can you, do you get your orders directly from the queen, or how does that work? <laughs> My question was going to be almost that stupid, but not quite. Right. Yeah. Very <laughs> close. Uh, this is right up there. <laughs> I, I am, yes, I do have an ordinary day job. I am what we call a barrister. Um, and uh, that is frequently mistaken for somebody who makes coffee, but it is a different. It is a different job. <laughs> well, there, there's no uh, S in it. There's no S. Exactly. That's also true. Um, so uh, barristers and the other branch of the legal profession, or the, the two main branches. There, there are other types, but there are barristers and solicitors and criminals. Right? Oh, and criminals. <laughs> So yeah. barristers and solicitors are what you would refer What's to What's the as Venn a, diagram of those three things? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably, it's probably, it would look like Mickey Mouse, probably. Yeah. <laughs> um, so um, barristers oh, and solicitors are both types of attorneys, but solicitors tend to do, well, they do non-contentious work, so they'll draft contracts and wills, and but you buy and sell houses using solicitors. Um, they are also involved in litigation, but it is the barristers who actually at least historically, have gone to court and argued the cases. It's got a bit more complicated because barristers now can do that in certain, uh, sorry, solicitors can do that in some circumstances. But basically, the barristers are the people who go and argue cases in court. And we still have to wear the stuff that barristers have been wearing for hundreds of years. So we have to wear uh, a wing collar, which of course is convenient because I have plenty of those. I can actually I'm one of the few people who can actually claim a wing collar as a tax deduction legitimately on two <laughs> completely unrelated bases. There aren't many of us. But, I but uh, here's my question, though. It, like Lance Burton's, are yours made out of Clorox bottles? Ah, well, actually, no, they're not. They're not. They, um, <laughs> although I have come across a washable uh, wing collar. They, there's a place that has actually started making them because they were a real pain. You needed to get them specially laundered. But there is now a non-Clorox bottle washable version, which uh, maybe Lance would like to know about because they're, they're all right <laughs> in England at the moment. Um, but yeah, so I wear the wing collar and the weird sort of bands that you, you, you have and you wear a three-piece suit and you have a gown. Um, and then I have to wear a wig, uh, a horsehair wig, a uh, sort of curly white powdered wig thing. <laughs> Uh, when I'm in court, which is which is very weird, but we do. Hey, I thought the rule was on this show: if you wear a wig at work, you have to wear it on the show. Well, isn't, ah. isn't isn't that <laughs> one of the rules that we laid down at the beginning, guy? Go yeah, get that, that thing, slap it We're on. Ask about it. I want to see it. Well, you know what? I uh, I can honestly say that if I had it, I would be very happy to demonstrate my wig for oh, you. Unfortunately, is it in a locker at work or something? Yeah, it actually is. And uh, yeah, since we've been doing all the hearing, it's at the, it's at the it's wig blocker. It's a wig blocker. <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, yeah, since we've been doing hearings from home, um, they did actually initially say that you were going to have to wear a wig, even doing a court appearance over Zoom. You were going to have to wear a wig. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they quickly realized that was probably not that smart. So uh, that was abandoned. Can't, and as a result, can't you just like, get the wig filter, like the cat filter? And just <laughs> yeah, we could probably yeah, good idea. Um, I, maybe we should have done that. Um, You're not the only one that needs a wig filter on this show. <laughs> <just saying. laughs> a, a barrister could be many different types of uh, litigator. Yeah. What? Discipline are you? Yeah, so I do, I do intellectual property. So I do okay. trademarks and copyright mainly, that sort of that sort of thing. Um, I don't do criminal work. Um, 
I don't do family. So even even if you did do outhouse deceptions, you would have enough IP and trademark knowledge to defeat Mac in in court. <laughs> That's probably true. Yeah, I would get that. Right <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, we actually have a photo of guy uh, in the wig. Uh, Nikki, if you could put that photo there, he is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, that is an uncanny, uh, uncanny resemblance. It changes uh, your <laughs> face so much. You couldn't have picked uh, a python with a better jawline. <laughs> I feel the, bound uh, as an intellectual property advisor to point out that the fact that that says Shutterstock across it makes me <laughs> feel the license. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's it's just not my uh, name just, on the show. <laughs> that just screwed up any uh, any <laughs> chance of us monetizing this episode. Way to go! Yeah. How do they say uh, cease and desist in England? <laughs> cease and desist. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. But you are, you know, speaking of doing magic, you are coming to the U.S. like you said, hopefully to do uh, Liberty, and uh, we're also appearing together. Yes. At uh, Abbott's get together. Yeah, that, that that's happen. great news. Yeah, yeah, yeah Michael's going to be there too. Yes, of course. Yeah, terrific. And maybe um, Jacob. Jacob's trying to come. No, no, I'll be there, but I'm not, I'm just going to be there irritating you guys. I'm not performing. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't yeah, have yeah, tickets to any bad. of the shows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I'm super excited about all of that, and uh, I guess I guess it's just too early to know what's feasible in terms of travel and what the requirements are going to be and vaccinations and all that kind of stuff. But if there's any way I can be there, I'm definitely going to be there. And um, yeah, I can't wait. Have you, Jacob, have you seen guys uh, like stand up act? I have not. I know oh, he did it at Magic Live and I didn't get to see it. So yeah. I'm that, yeah, that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm doing my kind of stage act thing. Oh, very excited. Yeah, cool, it's cool. fantastic. Right. Is- well, Guy Hollingworth, Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to a uh, guy named England, Vinny, Godot, Jacob Jacks. And uh, we, no thanks at all to uh, Nick DeFat, who's uh, oh, yeah. lost in America. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks to uh, Nikki and Stephen at uh, Neon Pineapple for all the production. And uh, we'll see you guys next time. We're going out as we do every week with a quote from my good friend, George Clinton. Now I'm as happy as a monkey with a peanut machine since I found you. Just imagine a monkey with a peanut machine. It's a dream come true. But but I don't need no nut machine because I'm nuts all over you. Oh, ah, yeah. You're so sweet. (laughs) See you next week. Subscribe to Don't Everybody Leave, and maybe they'll release me from Junkman Prison. Not gonna happen. Even in slow motion, it's amazing.